independent of how AI is going to change humanity, we still need our health care, our well-being, and everything else. And like you said, the challenge that we have is there's in one end all this innovation that you describe and that companies like yours are doing, but there's all the legacy systems and there's all the fragmented, even financial, economical, or insurance models that are, of course, independent of our kind of a country is developed or not is, is critical. So from your experience, and now you describe uh, in detail care. so what would be the, the first achievements that you would, of course, when I read your bio, there's a lot of achievements you did, especially in the relationship with U.S. states and the relationship with insurance and even different parts of you being conscious about creating solutions. But what would be the things that, let's say, if I look at five achievements and coming back to the $8 trillion of the, the healthcare the global industry, like five things that we would be highlighting as a priority to solve the different things using, of course, blockchain technology, of course, increasingly AI, but as well, practical things. Because I think the challenge is, I know, especially in the US, that there's still a huge amount of division in terms of the way you take society and it's actually probably getting worse, especially with the elections coming. But but the challenge is that can we unite society to create these solutions because the technology is there. And yeah. ultimately, during the 20th century, and this is a big question, but in, during the 20th century, we increased the life expectancy from 20 years old in the beginning of the 20th century, which was just 100 years ago. And for instance, even during the 20s, the 1920s, now we're in the 2020s, 100 years ago, during the, the Spanish flu, 300 million people more or less died. And we had just COVID, where actually the numbers were infinite and less. And at the same time, the world population in the beginning of the 20th century was 1 billion people. Now it's close to 8 billion people. So in proportion, we achieve fantastic improvement. The perception is still not correct. But coming back, five things, of course, think a bit about it, that you would think from your experience that you would consider that is that we can actually use these technologies to solve the real problems on a country basis and a global level. Now that's a really great question because there are so many, and they are country specific or regional. The problem that may be pervasive in US will not resonate in Canada or UK, but that is not to say that they don't have their own set of intermediaries with their own set of problems because the, the primary model, the underlying root cause of this issue of being intermediary heavy healthcare delivery is true everywhere. It's just that the intermediary's name and role may look different. But I want to come to your specific statement. So if you look at what we, you know, I look at it as very fundamentally first, what does a patient need to be more effective? And I, I really more take the role of what can I do as a parent to deliver better health care to my kids or to my, my parents who are now aging and need a lot of help. So essentially, the generation before me, the generation after me, what is it that they can, they should be able to do for a better? Let's take simple examples to illustrate for the audience. So right now, when you go buy a prescription, when you have a prescription from a doctor, you go to the pharmacy, you have no idea what the cost is going to be. You have no idea if the generic version of the same medication is one-third cheaper Most patients will simply hand the prescription over and wait for the pharmacy to say $27 or 200 yuan or, you know, 500 Korean won. Whatever the number is, we pay and we leave. We don't have any visibility into alternatives. We don't have any visibility into uh, into pros and cons of taking this drug versus the other. So this is one very simple, not simple, but very clearly understandable use case where blockchain can give patients un- objective, unmodifiable advice as to this drug has the same formulary as this generic. They're equivalent chemically. You can pay $62 for this, or you can pay $7.27 for this. And these choices are completely invisible. And patients are vulnerable. When you're going, when you're sick, your kid is sick, the last thing you want to do is to be seen haggling with a pharmacy over the cost of your kid's prescription. It feels wrong. But that doesn't mean that you should overpay because your kids are not going to get any better, any faster if you pay $6 or $60 for the same drug. But the drug doesn't care. Its efficacy is not determined by the amount of money you pay. The system, however, takes advantage of that. The system takes advantage of the patient's vulnerability 
and will charge whatever it thinks it can get away with, which then has a perverse effect that maybe the some of the treatment the kid needed you can't afford, and therefore you, they don't get because we have overspent on things that could have been rationally priced. So in a simple sense, bringing transparency and alternatives to a sticker shock at the pharmacy is a key priority for us. So we are bringing solutions in different parts of the world, working with different wholesalers who would love to bring their drugs, prescription drugs and, and non-controlled substances directly to the patient and does this does remove these intermediaries who are gigantic in size and very profitable at the cost of efficiency and at the cost of, of the patient. So if we just take this one example of streamlining the delivery of drugs at wholesale prices from party A, which has wholesale availability, to party B, the patient or the parent, that is currently a very difficult industry in that you have pharmacy networks, you have pharmacy benefit managers, you have, you know, you have con uh, secret contracts and rate negotiations between insurance and pharma, pharma and PBMs, and all this goes on so that the patient has zero transparency on the cost of the drug. And what you don't ever see anybody asking the question is, hey, I'm paying $150 for this 12 pills. How much do they cost to manufacture? And sometimes it costs 12 cents. So there is no connection between wholesale price of the drug and the retail price of the drug. And if we can use our solution to allow wholesale and retail to connect in a rational way, nobody's saying there should be no profitability. You know, 15% profit, 40% profit, whatever is rational. But the parent, patient has no visibility that this is 72,000% profit that's happening in, for the intermediary. And that's not correct. When the intermediary is pocketing you know, 7,000 times the cost of wholesale to sell you the drug, that's not good. I think that's not that's no longer serving. That's profiteering to the point where it's, it's harmful. So let's put the chain in to bring appropriate level of transparency and put the smart contract in to calculate the price of drug based on some rationality. So this is a very powerful use case that would work in every country. Of course, you'd have to, you, we are planning to launch it country by country, but it, re it relates to every human being because everybody's going to need prescription at some point in their life, either as a parent or as a patient or as a, or as a child of a parent who needs it. So that's one example. The other example that I would say is a very self-evident one, which is around control over medical records. Now, I will tell you without naming names, as of this morning, a personal anecdote that reinforced to me that everything we're doing needs to be done. So my mother, I'm at her house right now, and she has severe health condition that erupted about two weeks ago. So I left, I came over to spend time with her to help her. So a few days ago, like earlier this week, we took her to a hospital where she got her MRI, CT scan, and X-ray for her spinal condition, and she's in, she needs immediate attention. So yes, to, the day after I reached out to the hospital and I said, I would like to get her medical images, which... I know it's in their system because the doctor called me and said, I'm looking at your mom's MRI, CT scan, X-ray. She's better come in. We got to talk to her ASAP. So I want to get a second opinion. I want to get her X-ray images and, and MRI and CT scan, and they won't give it to us. Everything is in the electronic medical record. This EPIC system is so powerful. It's so cool. It's so tech heavy. And it's everywhere on every desktop in the hospital. So we went to this uh, therapist yesterday in the same hospital. He pulled up her X-ray, her CT scan, her MRI, and started to show it to us. Look, here are all the problems. And I said, why can't I get access to it? And he said, well, I don't know. There's a process involved. So I called them today again. And they said, you have to drive down to a facility in Baltimore, south of Baltimore, and you have to bring a power of attorney from your mom, notarized, or she has to come, despite the fact that she's in extreme pain, and you have to stand in line and within a two to three hour wait period will give you these documents. And I said, why can't you just email me the link? The answer is that's against our processes, our procedures. What they're really saying is, we want to make it so difficult for you to get your data, your records, so you don't have the rational ability to get a second opinion. We want to inhibit your optionality so you don't leave our healthcare system. So when she does have her surgery, 
out of exhaustion and fatigue, you will come to our hospital and you won't go to another hospital because we won't give you the records easily. And you would have to have extraordinary level of persistence to get what is yours out of our system. That's not a tech problem. That's a corruption problem. But what if those records never went into the control of the hospital? Why are they even sitting on these records when they belong to my mother? How come the lab didn't send us a copy? How come they went to the hospital? These are fundamental questions that we need to address. So medical record ownership and custody should be in the hands of the patient. The patient should have the ability to demand and store and collect and manage this record. And they should have the optionality to share it with somebody. Because here is my intent with mom. Every treatment option this hospital has offered us is very, very concerning. It could disable her for life. It's going to be extremely painful recovery. So I want to see if there is a better treatment option available in a different hospital in the United States, or maybe in Germany, or maybe in Korea. I want to know her choices. And the current system makes it impossible for me to know if there is a better alternative in Germany. Why? It's because the, the intermediary has decided that it is in their best interest to control the records and deny my mom access to her own data because that's how they guarantee revenue. This is fundamentally what we are trying to fix. And medical records, coming back to your five statement, a five problem question, this is your second problem, medical records. So we are launching a new capability in our care wallet, which is how patients interact with, with our system, where they can request and attach the legal document with the requesting, I have a right to my record. You cannot deny this to me. And here is the mechanism and the address where you must send it. And yes, the records are you know, going to be in my custody from moving forward. And there are lots of nuances to that. We've just signed a partnership with a company in Korea that's gathering medical records from various hospitals with the same intention. So we'll incorporate that data into the wallet. And we will incorporate the blue button, which is a government API in the US to pull all the Medicare data. The point is this problem has not arisen by accident. This problem has been carefully crafted by the intermediaries to make it difficult for my mother to have optionality. And this is what we must fix, not just the US, around the world. So that's a second example. Prescription, lack of transparency in drug prices, lack of, lack of access to your medical data, you know, to jump out. There are many others. You know, we can talk about referrals. You know, if I want to go see a specialist, who is the party that's making the referral? Why are they denying this referral ability? Doesn't the care protocol give me the right to make a, sec a physician, a specialty care opinion? Who makes that decision? Should it really be dependent upon a physician's judgment or should we have a protocol on the chain that tells me my right is to go see a specialist? So we, we have to look at, eat. there are hundreds, if not thousands of scenarios in healthcare depending upon the geography you live in and the healthcare system you're in, where you encounter this intermediary control decision-making. Every one of them is a target for solve care platform. To replace that opaque, centrally controlled decision-making with a transparent protocol that is, lives on the chain and auto-executes to give everybody a fair, equitable participation and restores their rights. Oh, thank you so much. That's a fantastic summary and very sharp. 